All right. Thanks to everyone for joining us today. So my name is Ryan Smith. I'm Assistant Director, Career Advisor for the Arts at Tufts University Career Center. And we're so excited to have you here today. We have a bunch of panelists and a really awesome student turnout. So I'm super excited about that. Um, we did capture your survey questions in advance and we do have some we're gonna go over. So there is some crossover with what you're looking to find out today. If for any reason we don't cover, you know, it's kind of a tight time frame. if we don't get to everything, just know you can reach back out to me at ryan.smith at tufts.edu and we'll kind of loop through to close any gaps on questions and things like that. Um, as you know, we've been really busy this summer just promoting summer programs for all of you and the 2020 grads to make sure that you feel connected and engaged and um, feel like you have resources and know that we're here for you. So we wanna, we definitely wanna keep that up. Um, we're just gonna ask for the sake of the workshop um, while we're online, just for preventing feedback and that, just stay muted. You'll be able to reach out to us during, um, via the chat during the workshop as we're talking through things. And uh, again, we can follow up on the end if there's something we missed. Um, and if you wanted to uh, close video, that's fine too, as this will be recorded and posted on our YouTube um, Career uh, Center channel. So, all right, so without further ado, I wanna introduce our panel. So I'm just gonna call them out and then they'll be able to kind of give you a quick intro and then we'll dive right into some questions. So I'll start with Tulani. Hi, y'all. Um, my name is Tulani Elisa. I am a graduate of uh, the Fletcher School for Law and Diplomacy, class of 2010. Um, I am the Vice President of Social Media at Fox Entertainment. So I lead the team that handles social for all of our TV shows. So Simpsons, Bob's Burgers, The Masked Singer, number one TV show, um, Prodigal Son, uh, all of those. I lead the team that creates content, strategies, ideas, works with talent, works with producers and directors um, to make sure that on social we are getting people engaged uh, uh, in the right way and really pushing the show forward. So that's that. Awesome. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, hey guys, I'm Catherine Armistead. I uh, graduated in 2017 um, from the Tufts Dual Degree Program with the Museum School, and I'm currently a product designer at Wayfair. Um, and so my day to day is uh, anything from usability testing our website to doing some detailed designs in Sketch um, to holding workshops with stakeholders and other designers. Awesome. Sam Kindler. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Sam Kindler. I graduated from Tufts undergrad in 2011. Oh, Kyle and I are actually classmates. Um, <laughs> so I, um, I'm based in New York, although I'm in Connecticut right now. I work for a company called Capacity Interactive. I'm a senior consultant there. We are a digital marketing consulting firm that works with nonprofit arts and cultural institutions. So we work with over 200 different arts organizations all over the country and Canada. Um, our clients include people or organizations like New York City Ballet, um, the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston, the Kennedy Center, the LA Philharmonic, the Public Theater. Um, and we work with those organizations on their digital marketing strategy and implementation. Um, so yeah, happy to be here. Great. Kyle. Hi, everybody. I'm Kyle Circus, uh, also class of 2011. Um, and I am currently the Associate Managing Director at Playwrights Horizons in New York City. We're a Pulitzer Prize winning off-Broadway theater company. We actually just uh, won our seventh Pulitzer uh, earlier this year for the musical A Strange Loop, <laughs> um, which we're very excited about. Um, and in my role, I oversee marketing and ticketing and also work uh, with our fundraising team and on institutional advancement, which is a very interesting topic to dive into these days. Awesome. Dexter. Yeah, hey guys, how's it going? I graduated um, 2018 from Tufts. I'm actually based in Los Angeles these days. I'm working at a company called Esmail Corp, which is a small TV and film production company. Um, some of our stuff, we've worked on a couple shows lately, like, I don't know, Mr. Robot is one that we've had. We had Homecoming more recently, and then uh, Briar Patch on USA Network. 
So I kind of work, help facilitate the team, um, creating shows, attaching talent to projects and uh, working in a more sort of, um, you know, the far reaches of the entertainment industry. So that's uh, something I'm happy to talk about if anyone has any questions. Awesome. All right, so let's go ahead and we'll just dive into questions. Um, so I'm gonna pose this to everyone and I'll just let you guys jump in and kind of help monitor to make sure everybody gets heard. Um, so what would you say right now from when you started and dove into the industry, what are some of the biggest changes uh, since COVID? You know, and how has that affected your daily routine, the, the sector that you're in specifically and that, whoever would like to start? Well, I can say for entertainment in general, obviously COVID has affected a huge part of everything we do. So production was halted, um, all of our alternative shows, so shows that are with live audiences, um, those were all you know, put on hold and, and it's still a little bit up in the air when things will be able to come back. Um, and it, it feels like that's kind of like a, it might be a small thing, but when you think about it, if everyone's on hold and then everyone's trying to come back at the same time, you're now at looking for stages and studios and places that you're able to work. Um, it's also changed because it's put even more of a focus on the social and digital space. And so, you know, there is way, there are ways to still create content, to create TV shows, to create uh, digital shorts. And so I've really tasked my team and myself with finding ways to continue to push forward, um, to make shows online and to uh, create videos with our talent from where they are. Um, we did a really great uh, Pride Month presentation where we were able to work with our LBGTQIA plus talent to do FaceTime photo shoots, um, to do interviews through FaceTime and create, you know, a video with them, to work with some really great drag queens, to do cocktails every week. But, you know, what it really, you know, pushes you to do is, you know, work with your talent and work with what you have because um, it really has uh, impacted how everything is running. Definitely. Kyle, would you like to jump in on that and talk about, um, I think it's the podcasting that you guys are doing now and the different projects there? Sure. So, so to just back up a little bit, I think um, as someone who works exclusively in the not-for-profit space, um, I think it's been, I think COVID has been uh, a test for, for every industry across the board. Um, specifically in theater, there's, there's the existential challenge of the fact that our core business of producing live art in front of a gathered audience and at an appointed time has been totally taken away from us for who knows how long. Um, and I think the the fact that we are a nonprofit institution makes it an even more challenging puzzle to put together in terms of relevance because if your core mission is or, or your core activity is taken away from you, how do you actually prove your value um, when we're really relying on contributed income so much more than we would normally have to lean on that? Um, but we are we are fortunate. Um, and I know Sam and Tulani can probably speak to this as well. Um, we've been really focused on building our digital presence, our digital capacity internally in terms of staffing and resources. Um, and Ryan, like you mentioned, we've we've had a project uh, that was in development for about a year and a half, which is an original scripted fiction podcast called Soundstage. It's an anthological series of new plays um, that are produced expressly for the podcasting platform. So it's giving our artists a digital stage. Um, and we had been planning to release it in a slightly different way this summer. Um, but with everything that was happening around us, we realized that it was our... Um, sort of silver arrow in, in our quiver in terms of being able to actually reach and engage with our audience in the moment when people were self-isolating um, and to bring high quality 
theater to their ears, um, just not from our stages. Um, so I think what that speaks to in my mind is the need across all industries to remain agile, to remain really innovative, and to think about the resources, both nascent and existent, that you have at your disposal and how you can actually um, adapt to the, to the world that's constantly changing around you. Great. I can just jump in now because I think my yeah. words sort of straddle Kyle's and Tulani's. Um, obviously, you know, my, um, my company is a for-profit company, but we serve almost exclusively nonprofits. So um, we are very much seeing the kind of devastation that COVID has um, sort of wreaked over all of these organizations who, like Kyle said, had to halt all uh, live performances. Um, it's It's been very difficult for most of these organizations because, of course, they have no um, revenue coming in from their ticket sales and all of that. And so what typically happens when that ha when something like that happens is, you know, people are halting their marketing efforts, they're cutting their budgets because they also have to cut staff and all of that. So a big challenge that we've been working on with our clients is how to stay relevant, how to stay active and engaging with your audiences during this time, whether you have a marketing budget for it or not. Um, because as we know now with COVID, everyone is at home, we're on Zoom all the time, we're on social media all the time. So, you know, people are hearing from all sorts of different brands and these nonprofit organizations have to still focus on how they can connect to their audiences, but particularly their most important audiences, their subscribers, their members, because eventually things will go back to quote unquote normal and we have to make sure that we stay top of mind for people. Um, so it's been really interesting for me because um, my background is primarily in theater, uh, but our clients are across all different art forms. And, you know, while I think it's been devastating across all of the different art forms, there are some that are going to be able to open up sooner than others. Um, so right now, what I'm dealing with a lot, actually, particularly in Boston, are all my museum clients are starting to open back up this week and next week. Um, so it's been really interesting to see the new challenge of how do we get people to feel comfortable coming back to arts organizations, making them feel safe and communicating that with them. Awesome. Um, Catherine, so thinking about working um, at an organization like Wayfair and sort of the duality that you have too, as, as all of you do in different capacities, um, and anyone, you know, like ourselves who have a creative background, creative areas of interest, so working at a company that, you know, maybe some of that transition to a virtual environment or being able to work from home was something that was already there. Um, but then doing that and maintaining your current role, but also balancing that artistic creative component. Maybe you could talk about that part a little, Catherine. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm, I'm really fortunate. And um, yeah, Wayfair, it's already a pretty digital company. And so we're all working from home. We've all been working from home since mid-March and probably will be through the end of this year just because our office is huge and in a mall so it's not really <laughs> conducive to kind of like um you know the the new world that we live in but um I would say the the challenge that I didn't anticipate is um kind of how to make up for all that collaboration that I normally do with people where I stop them in the hallway and I show them design work or we just like touch base and trying to stru have structured touch points and collaboration sessions with people that still f have that sense of like, this is fun to it. Um, so I think like I've had to diversify the tools I use a lot and have been using a lot of um, Miro, which is kind of like an online whiteboarding tool and thinking about how do you have sketching workshops with everybody remote and, and vote together and um, kind of like align on some visions. So I would say like overall, it's definitely been something where I like the shift has been um, fairly easy because I spend most of my day at my computer already. But in terms of collaborating and also making space for people who are caring for their kids, right, who are balancing a lot of responsibilities right now, I think we're doing a lot more um, kind of ad hoc feedback sessions or I'll post something and somebody can add comments and annotations to it. Um, you know, at like 9 p.m. at night when they actually have the time to focus on work. So I think it, increasing flexibility, but also trying to provide that structure for collaboration has been probably the hardest part. Great. Um, Dexter, how about you on this question with your experience um, starting with DTA and then kind of doing this, you know, multitasking at the hill with all the different pieces with production, 
um, that you're responsible for now. Can you just talk a little bit about kind of what you've been seeing as well? Yeah, definitely. I think it's a, I mean, it's obviously such a big question that so many people have been trying to tackle in different ways. I think that uh, on the production side of things, something that's been big is using um, like new breakthrough technologies in terms of having sets that are really, really, really agile and can move around and we can use like sort of advanced green screen type technology to have way less people on a set and not have to have 50 extras going around and being able to fill that digitally or through other ways via this technology that's coming out. Um, and so it's been something that I think everyone's still struggling with how to maintain authenticity in terms of things like continuity in a shot or having the feel of a large group audience for a bigger scene while still wanting to make sure things are safe and we're gonna be able to get back to production. Um, so I think it's a question that in a lot of ways is still being answered by a lot of production teams on what's gonna be the best way to maintain quality while maintaining safety at the same time. Um, right. So yeah, I think it's really interesting to see. And I think as these new types of programs are coming out, it's gonna be something where we'll be able to see if audiences are liking it or disliking it. And I think the entire industry is really gonna to have to adapt from there. Definitely. So probably the biggest burning question um, that students are thinking about right now. So the recent grads from May 2020 that definitely experienced a major cultural shift with finishing, you know, an epic milestone and, and, and being in this new world. Um, and then our current students who are thinking, okay, I'm graduating next May or I'm looking for internships, not seeing postings, kind of having uncertainty, you know, reaching out to us and engaging with the Career Center but just thinking, how do I market myself? What's gonna set me apart? How do I stay engaged without, um, you know, I think that balance that we all remember when we were first starting out of how do I reach out to alum, people in my network contacts without feeling um, like I'm a burden or a nuisance. And, you know, right now I think the balance for them is how do I stay active and engaged where should I be looking for opportunities and, and what's gonna, what's the right way that I can try to do this? So anybody that wants to jump in on that question to start. I think that, you know, as horrible as this whole thing has been, I think I'm constantly trying to think about it as an opportunity, being given more time. Um, I don't have to commute anymore and trying to sort of reframe it in that way for myself so that I'm not just depressed about it all the time. Um, <laughs> and I certainly, you know, feel so horrible for all of the people who've recently graduated or are about to graduate because um, it's, it's tough out there. Um, I think, you know, my biggest piece of advice with that would be thinking about the area of the industry you want to go into, think about companies that you're interested in, and spend your time researching them, reading their blogs, if they have podcasts, listening to their podcasts, really delving into the industry in any way that you can, so that when there are more job opportunities and you are getting interviews, you know, you can have discussions about what you were spending your time doing during this time. There's tons of free or inexpensive online classes to learn how to code or to you know learn from webinars from different organizations and i think that will be really imperative um, to help set you up for success later on and obviously i think networking with other jumbos i don't think a jumbo would ever tell you that it's a burden or a nuisance it's not for me thank so you for saying that out loud. i think it's true <laughs> i think it's so true i meet with so many tough students all the time and we we really i think i don't want to speak for all the panelists but we like to help our own so um yeah and i think you know that's a great mentality to take um you know though it is a crazy time and and kind of similar to like but m much worse than like 2008 when graduates were coming out and there weren't many job options i think it's really like uh, i think sam is right like it's so great to keep learning and to you know do research on the things that you're interested in but i also think it's a really great time to take the mentality of we've never been here before, right? A lot of people are very anxious about when's it gonna go back to normal or when are the things gonna be like they used to be? And like, it's a spoiler alert, like they're never gonna be the same, right? <laughs> You're never gonna go back to how they used to be. Every institution, every place is never gonna run the same way. They're not gonna have offices the same way. You know, things are not gonna be executed the same way. And it's, you know, it, it can feel tough, but it's also an opportunity. And I, you know, told this to someone, who, and she probably graduated maybe a year or two ago, um, but 
do do what feels right. So if it's, you know, you've always wanted to move to California, move to California. You know, if you want to get a house in the middle of nowhere in, you know, North Dakota, Minnesota, wherever it might be, it's the time because everyone's working remotely, right? And so it's like, you know, I think it's really important right now to like get serious with yourself and get out of the like, well, I have to wait till things are gonna go back and say, you know, what can I do now? And especially for people interested in communications, in art, in acting, in any kind of thing that you're a content creator, create. So your home, write something. You know, you have time, make the videos you always wanted to make, start a fashion blog, start writing on your own, start writing your own scripts, you know, start going through what you love about theater and figuring out, you know, what's the way forward and how can I be a part of what that way forward looks like. But this is actually, you know, uh, really the time to say, okay, this is unprecedented. This is not a moment in time. It's not a flash in the bucket. This is a huge moment that is, I mean, is gonna last for at least two years. And I know that it feels, that feels like a lot, but it takes four to five years to find a vaccine, right? And even though we have so many people working on it, it's still like, if it took half the time, you're in a two, two and a half year time frame. So if you're working from a space where you're a creator and you're a creative, now is the time to be like, well, there's no one on my back telling me I have to do this or it has to be this way because nobody knows the answer right and so if that's the case then you know especially this class and you know people that are this age like you guys are so creative you're so smart you are you know so outspoken and have so many ideas on stuff whether it's like you just go down the rabbit hole and you create a really sick TikTok account to like you you know <laughs> write a script that you submit to south by southwest because you don't have to worry about getting there next year you just have to worry about creating right so like i think it's you know no, it can feel scary, but also it's it's time to like really reframe how you're approaching it because honestly, like there's nothing we can do, right? Like it's not, there's not like a, a, a switch we can flip. There's not something where it's gonna like resolve itself really quickly. So I think, you know, reframing it is like, yes, I do feel bad, but I, I also feel really like if this was me and like went back to when I graduated from college and there was like kind of no rules, like I, you know, maybe I would have gone somewhere else or done something different. Um, so I think, you know, also be encouraged and I think, Sam's right, learning, but also really start creating and start getting deeper into, you know, your art and the things that you love, because, you know, that's where that magic and that way forward is going to show itself. And I, and just to jump in for one second and to bridge to Lonnie, what you were saying with what Sam was saying, I, for me, this is a question that people, especially on the hiring side of the business, get asked all the time. And I think both of you are so spot on insofar as creating your own work is going to be a huge, there's a huge runway for that. And not only is there a runway for creating it for low cost and remotely in, in new ways, um, but also there's a really wide berth for it to be discovered by people. Um, because so much of how content is distributed these days is democratized and you have as, you as an individual have as much control as a big brand on these platforms. Um, but, I, but I think to just add and sort of deepen those two points, when you're creating it, it, and when you're seeking out people who've blazed a trail that you want to follow, it's all about finding your people. Um, I, you know, Sam and I were, were and still are friends from college. We, ha we run with a very highly creative group of people who, who, many of whom are still creating pieces together. That's an amazing thing. Stick with that. Um, find your tribe and, and make them follow, well, follow each other. Um, but I think when it comes to reaching out, it doesn't, the rule that Sam was talking about doesn't just apply to Tufts alum. Find people whose career paths you want to emulate in some way. Um, I'm the son of a legal recruiter, so this I have my mom's voice in my head when I say <laughs> that people love to talk about themselves. Why are we on this panel for an hour today? Um, so you know, like it, and and anyone I think 
I'd be hard pressed to think of anyone in my network who, if you sent an email, a blind email to them saying, Hey, I saw your LinkedIn or I saw something you posted on Twitter. You're a really interesting person. Can we meet for 20 minutes on, on zoom? Um, most of them would say yes, especially because we all have time now. Um, and I think, I think there's often a misconception around informational interviews that they're hard to get and that they won't lead you anywhere. The fact of the matter is people are willing to do them all the time because you're not asking anything of them and they are what you make of them. Um, they can turn into jobs because you never know. I get emails every day. Do you know someone who specializes in this skill or who's green and who would be willing to work for X? Um, and if I, if you're the person I just talked to, I'm going to say, yeah, I can connect those dots and put you in touch with the right people. Um, and I think that's, we've had it paid forward to us in so many ways. It's, I, I think I speak for everyone on the panel when I say we all want to pay it forward to others. Um, and that doesn't just apply to the people you're seeing on your screen. Awesome. Also, I would so, note there oh, are some jobs out there, guys. So I, it it's not like it's like a desert of work. And so I, I think we're like, we all are encouraging you guys to, to reach out and be creative and network. But, you know, look at the industries that are booming. Like, I just to be honest, I'm in one of them, right? Like social media and television have never been more important, right? Because people are home and people are looking for content and all of that. So, you know, look at the companies that, you know, are creating things or making things and still able to push forward in a lot of ways. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, especially when you're just getting out of college, you don't have to find your forever job you can find a job that's going to get you connections that's going to help you network that's going to get you experience and then you can move on to something else you're you know like super young and so it's like don't be afraid to like I, I know when I was younger I used to just apply for so many things that looked right to me on like LinkedIn and just say like oh I like doing these things I could get some good experience um, and so I would say also don't be afraid to like just look for things, especially ones that you wouldn't have considered before, like things that aren't local and stuff like that. But people are still hiring too. Yeah, I definitely, I think, oh, sorry. I just wanted to highlight that part that that's something we, um, we highlight with, with students a lot is your career is something you look back on and it takes time to build. So making sure that you're, um, you know, one of the questions that came up was how do I kind of, if I have diverse interests and know that I'm in a lot of areas, like how do I dive in? And I think, just starting somewhere, you know, it's the networking, it's having the informational interviews, it's trying things, and maybe it's for a few years, maybe it's a post-grad internship, because that's what's on the table, and it's exposure, it's networking, it's skill building, it's shining the spotlight on different things, and kind of like an optometrist changing the prescription that fits for the right time and the right audience and all of that. So it's good to hear you all say that as well. But go ahead, Kyle, you're going to say something. Well, Brian, to, to build on that and to now cement my role as the perpetual piggybacker of this conversation. Um, <laughs> the, um, I think you're exactly right. And I, and I think the, the important thing, and I, I'm so, I, I do want to just say from the outset, like, I'm so happy that this conversation is happening. Um, because I know at least when we, when Sam and I were in our undergrad career, um, this, especially as people who were interested in the administrative side of a creative field, these were the conversations that we never had access to. Um, so I love that this is happening and I love that there's such an interest in these conversations. Um, but I, but I also feel a responsibility to say the things that, that sort of get left out of these conversations, which is one, Applying for jobs is a muscle and you have to build it and, mm -hmm. and it takes practice and it takes work. And I am, I will sing this song until the end of time. Like it, it is not always fun, but sometimes you just got to do it and you've got to start somewhere and you never know what kind of traction you're going to get or what role might become right for you in a way that you never considered. And the other side of that is that I, um, the, I think there is a misconception around job descriptions that they are hard and fast lists of requirements. 
And especially when you're either just graduated or, or on the cusp of graduating, there's always this sense of, or at least I felt this, of like, well, they're asking for two or three years of experience. Do I really have that? Guess what? If you had an on-campus job, you have that experience. And you can always parlay a lot of the things that you did in school into a transferable story. I got my first job in marketing because I was a tour guide for four years. And I talked about the relatability of, of translating a college experience into an hour versus translating a show or a, a season into a radio spot or something like that. Um, do not look at a job description as a hindrance. Look at it as an opportunity to shine a light on your skills and to say, here's what I do bring to the table. Here's what you weren't asking for. And to show you're curious and able to learn new skills that you can pick up the slack of what, what you don't bring already. Awesome. And we did just one of our summer programs that I led with Misha and Susanna was uh, talking about your transferable skills. Um, and so for those that missed that, that is on our YouTube, um, career center playlist as well. And, and that's, that's key. I think it's, you know, another question that's coming up is as a actor or um, someone who is on stage or wanting to be on stage and be a performer or an artist in a gallery and, and showing work and doing residencies, you know, how can you um, dive in or what, what can I be doing if that's my background? So I think the transferable skills thing is, is important. I'd love for you guys to touch on this, um, you know, for those that could consider right now something that has more of an administrative lean to engage them and stay connected, to be inspired by the artists in that field and think about, um, you know, my piece of advice would be to just jump in and um, stay engaged and try different things right now. Um, sometimes it is easier as an artist or performer to have the opportunity to audition more and get more access and, um, you know, in the traditional sense of being on stage or, or that type of thing. But I think now more than ever, it's important to exercise those other muscles of the job search and engaging and skill building too. So it's again, kind of shifting that spotlight um, and just thinking about, all right, what skills do I have? Where, where is there a need? I think that um, comment you were all making about creating content now, since you have that downtime and you don't have to follow, you know, said rule book of performance or artist careers or that kind of thing, you're able to create new pieces. So I'd love to hear for somebody who, you know, what would be your thoughts on for those of uh, the students in the audience who are thinking, you know, I identify maybe more as a performance artist or an artist or, you know, a lot of times, for example, uh, SMFA students that have creative um, skills in Adobe Suite, um, that's an excellent way to kind of have a foundation and pay the bills in the interim of, um, you know, being able to get their work seen more. So if there's any advice about, about that for those that maybe identify more as an artist or performer, you know, key things you think they could be doing right now too. Yeah, I'll say from my side, um... It's, I, one of the main people on my team had majored in uh, performance art and is a singer um, and is, you know, super talented. Um, and literally the other day, I just gave her feedback of like, you're working on copy and writing for our main Fox TV handle has over a million followers. And I was like, you're playing this role, right? Like this is you being creative. So you are now taking on, you know, the voice of this handle, the voice of, you know, this brand. And honestly, that put the whole thing in perspective for her, right? And so like, that's just a very small example to say a lot of what you're doing, especially in the creative space is like, like and and in other positions that might be in entertainment or might be at like a nonprofit somewhere, you are using the skills that you have as an actor to take on different voices, to think of things in different ways, to do research about what the background of this character or this brand is. And you're able to use those skills to create content, to create a voice, to create a persona. Um, and so there's a ton of opportunity to do that through writing, through content creation, through social. And then I would also say, you know, another big way and an obvious way is like build up your personal brand. So like, you know, and I, we keep harping on like creating and all that, but social media is still a really important thing um, for anyone in the creative industry, anyone in entertainment. We're always going to look and see, you know, okay, what kind of presence do they have on social? Are they posting regularly? Are they interacting with people? Do they have people that are, you know, interested in 
what they're talking about? Does it feel authentic? All of that. And it's still something that, you know, can be a way for you to show who you are, to show, you know, a lot of people that I know out in LA that are actors or musicians are, you know, still doing audition tapes and, and still going on Zooms with, you know, other friends in the industry and reading plays and reading scripts and creating content because, like like applying for jobs it's a muscle you have to get better at it you have to make it stronger you have to keep you know practicing what that looks like um for you and i think also it's like you have more time to look internally like what are you know how am i expressing myself what kind of roles do i want to play what kind of you know spaces can i envision myself in and so i would say one just look at like what you were saying, Ryan, like look at all the ways that your talents and your experience can be morphed and used in other spaces, especially creativity in writing um, and content creation and taking on brand voices. And I would also say like really like double down on social media and start to build your presence and start to, you know, get content out there. Look at the hashtags that are trending. Look at the other accounts that, you know, you might want to emulate or pull things from and then you know get with you know like Kyle said get with your tribe and keep creating right keep reading keep you know putting together audition tapes keep finding you know monologues or scripts that make sense to you to like read and see where like your passion really lies like what's the kind of conversations that are really bringing the best out of you um I'd love to jump in just from like the visual art side I think when I was graduating, I had this perception, and I think it's really common, of like, in order to be a successful artist, I need to get gallery representation. I need to apply to all these group shows that cost like $30 to $40 for me to even have them look at my pieces and tell me that I'm, you know, they, I, I'm not a fit for the show, um, and do kind of like this list of things. And I think it's really important um, for visual arts to understand and like recognize that there are so many different kinds of artists out in the world and just because you don't have gallery representation um right out of school or even like like I don't have gallery representation three years later and I find like my day job which I I love because I get to be creative and I do think as artists as visual artists if you go into something like design you have kind of a leg up of this what I would call almost like not being afraid to fail or, you know, not being too tied to your ideas because you spend so much time critiquing work that's like, you know, you're like, this is my my heart on a page. And if you are talking about like designing a website or an ad or something, it's not that same level. And so I think it's you, there's an openness to feedback and to input um, that's really valuable. And I think also just, yeah, I, I think creating is the most important thing to be doing right now and honestly always as an artist. Like keep making work, keep um, evaluating that work and playing around with it and experimenting um, and getting feedback even though, like recently I've been texting my friends pictures of paintings and like bad lighting and saying, you know, what do you think of this or what should I change about it? And you can still have critique and you can still grow your work in a remote setting, but I think it's important to have that self-motivation and um, to build that up. And those opportunities will happen and mm -hmm. they, you know, you'll, you'll get that moment of, you know, oh, work in a gallery or you'll get into that jury show you really, really wanted to. Um, you'll get that opportunity to do, uh, to be like a teaching assistant at Haystack, but you have to keep creating the work that feeds that and don't see the lack of opportunities as, a reflection on you or on your work because it's really hard to get those opportunities and sometimes it's it, it's not what you need in the moment which is a weird thing to say but I found it really helpful to not get opportunities sometimes and continue to work on my work and it, it just builds up your confidence and the value of your work on its own without all these people looking at it if that makes sense. Definitely. Um, Dexter, so I wanted to move into this next question and and thinking back about when you were graduating we connected up the um hashtag adulting series reception which that will be on deck uh the school year as well there'll be some version of that so stay tuned um and we talked about kind of you're wanting to break into entertainment and having some exposure and enhancing your skill sets in that and then jumping in um the move to la and um getting into uta and then production and that kind of thing 
Um, wondering if you could kind of kick us off with the part about there's so many resources and ways to network too for students that sometimes it can be overwhelming. So I was thinking, I, we'll start with Dexter first, but if there's um, key networks uh, that maybe students aren't thinking about, you know, we all know about the LinkedIn and the, the Herd, the Flash Mentoring Portal on, um, through Tufts. Um, but if there's a, within your niche area, a professional association, some that I throw out would be, you know, looking for entertainment jobs on mandy.com or entertainmentcruise.net, Playbill, following the trades, that kind of thing. Um, but resources or people you've connected with uh, within the Tufts network, um, just kind of anything to, to point students in the right direction. Yeah, totally. I think what was most useful for me as a starting point was probably to identify other alums like we've spoken to and just being really unabashedly curious about what they're doing and asking for their time, even if it's just a few minutes. Um, but I think that's something that's important to consider also, especially for the entertainment mm -hmm. industry, is that people want to, it's almost the way that you're learning about them, they're also going to be taking a lot of the, from what you're bringing to the discussion. So I'd really encourage anyone who's reaching out to these alums to make the most out of it in that if they are in the representation business, like agents at a place like UTA or something, that you know who their clients are, that you know you've done your homework, you understand what's big in their career that they're excited about and they want to talk about. Because if you come on with an agent and you say, oh, hey, I'd really love to hear about this. By the way, I really love what this actor did on this show. It was probably, you know, it had a big impact on me that person's gonna think of you in a much bigger way and be much more likely to bring you up in a conversation to somebody as where if you're just constantly asking questions, while that's great, you're gonna get a lot of that from yourself. There might not have that same trust that you can build in the conversation. And so that was really something, obviously, I think I was one of the most recent graduates. I think that was something that was big for me was treating every conversation and really sort of over preparing for it as much as possible especially with all this time that we have on our hands now to try to get the most out of it. Um, so then, yeah, just touch on resources, like you were saying, things that are big in the entertainment industry, if you're looking for information on that, are definitely the trades, Variety, Deadline, Hollywood Reporter, things like that. Um, just to know if there's been a big acquisition, if that person's company has a new ownership, if they just made partner at a big firm, something like that. Um, but then there's also things like IMDb Pro or Studio System that are great archives of representation and who represents a big actor or what their production company is called or do they have a deal at Warner Brothers or at Universal or whatever, wherever it might be. And that's something that's definitely uh, having that knowledge always rubs off and gives a great impression. It can help sort of bring that conversation to the next level and make it more of a an ongoing relationship as opposed to a one-off Zoom or phone call. I have one quick resource or yeah. plug. Um, I think, again, I feel like I'll, I'll keep just saying reframing, but one like exciting opportunity that this gives us is like that everything is virtual now. Um, so there's a lot of things that I think normally would have maybe been gated to some people are becoming less gated. Uh, for example, there's a tremendous number of conferences that are going virtual. Um, and like, for example, we do, my company does an annual um, uh, conference and um, it's definitely one that's gonna have to go virtual this year. And with that opportunity comes the ability to hopefully give out discounted or free tickets to students or people who've been laid off, things like that. So I encourage you, again, if there's like a specific sect of the industry that you're interested in, see if there's an opportunity for a free conference. Um, I also know that with these virtual conferences, they're trying to find ways to make networking like less awkward on Zoom and stuff like that. So it could be something, if you were even intimidated to go to something like that before, I think it's going to be a lower barrier to entry. Um, and that's a great way to like learn about prominent people in your industry and, and network with, um, with people. Definitely. And when, when conferences are virtual too, um, or in person rather, there's always that opportunity to um, volunteer. And mm -hmm. sometimes that means you get like two out of three sessions free. Um, like the inbound conference that happens um, happened in Boston through HubSpot, and we were able to, um, you know, we were able to attend that through the Career Center. But also, there's plenty of people I knew that were volunteering for, you know, maybe two or three shifts, and were able to get um, high, you know, high quality content and access to things. So, 
there, with the current shift, there could be plenty of ways for you to volunteer. And, you know, if you feel really comfortable with Zoom or value what a nonprofit does, um, maybe it's reaching out to that point person saying, I'd really love the experience. I'm just looking, you know, it's not a big amount of time. You're not sort of interning for free or not for credit or that kind of thing. It's just another way to build looking for those opportunities. Like uh, we also have jumbos for jumbos. So there's specific project type positions that are posted on Handshake as well. And you can just search those right there. So for the alum here today that may think of projects like that, that could work, we can definitely get those posted, but current students should definitely um, think about checking those out as opportunities. And, you know, it's looking at how you manage your time and engage with that as a resource. Um, another resource to, to think about is with COVID-19, there are some funding resources for artists, um, actors and, and the like. Um, and so some other organizations in New York Foundation for the Arts would be great. Any of the state arts alliances, I think there were smaller ones within different, like City of Cambridge and within Boston as well. Um, so any arts uh, department or cultural affairs department, that's definitely one of the first best places to look. Um, because even if it's minimal, it can help with creating one piece or, you know, doing video and it could help fund you while you're volunteering for that conference or something like that. So those are definitely key resources. Um, I think also, yeah, you know, ahead. look at the people who are throwing the conferences, right? A lot of those are like groups that are probably specific to what you're interested in. So I, you know, top of mind for me is ColorCom, which is Women of Color and Communications. Um, and they had, you know, like a two day or one day summit in replacement of their usual three day conference that they have. Um, but they also do like weekly lives on IG. They also have, you know, a list of jobs that they send out every week. They also, you know, you know, have been waiving membership fees for a lot of stuff, um, just knowing where people are and that people are at home. So it's also, you know, look at the people that are throwing it and seeing, you know, is there an affinity group that makes sense for you to join? Um, goes back to Kyle's point about tribes, goes back um, to Dexter's point about networking. If, you know, you're part of the same group, you could be, you know, if you're starting in the communications or even acting, uh, whatever it might be, you could be in the same group with someone that's been doing it for 10, 20 years because, you know, that's what groups like that are made for. Um, and so I think, you know, that's where the authentic, net authentic networking um, comes in. That's where, you know, finding ways that you can already relate to people um, because you can say like, oh, hey, we're both in, you know, Actors for change, whatever it might be. So I think it's it's also looking at the people that are creating those groups and and finding out how you can join for either a low cost or if they're you know at least doing something where you can like preview it or saying like I'm gonna spend the hundred and twenty hundred fifty bucks for the year because this will be helpful in the long run. So awesome. Um, so another question. Uh, there's obviously resources within each niche area for sh students be on their resume and LinkedIn to showcase um, portfolios. You know, some art schools use Behance. Um, we're, I know we're looking at investing in how can we do something with art students specifically, do more with portfolios because we are in a virtual situation now. Um, a lot of times we coach students with Squarespace or Wix site or something like that. And I would say across majors too, so not just an artist portfolio or someone who's in one of the designer engineering programs. One thing I always say is your website is as good as somebody, you know, as the amount of traffic you direct to it. So highlighting on your resume, highlighting on your social media, you know, having that presence. Are there any resources like that, like a Vimeo or Behance or, um, you know, and I would say across arts, across entertainment, any anything for kind of uh, promoting personal brand beyond, you know, maybe something that's newer that you've seen? I can't speak to the platforms themselves, but what I will also say is that as a non-artist who hires artists, um, <laughs> in addition to the traffic to the um, portfolio, it has to be usable and intuitive and easy to access. And, and the other, and I was just coaching an intern on this the other day, um, lead with your strongest content. Do not make me dig for the video that you spent a year making and that's <laughs> going to be sixth on your list of things for me to watch. 
I'm going to watch the first thing, maybe the second thing, and then I'm going to make a decision. Um, so prominence is really key um, and make sure that a Luddite like me can still navigate it. <laughs> yeah, just to just to jump in on that, a lot of, especially in entertainment, what you see is people sending, you know, like they'll have a project, a project document, the script, like a bio, a character breakdown and all these things. And I think we actually just picked up a project the other day that came off of a three minute Vimeo video where this video was grabbed you from the first second, brought you all the way through, gave a sense of the artist vision and the way the talent that they had as, in, as a writer performer. And so I think just to, just to double down on that, if you can consolidate as much as possible and go with quality over quantity and just say, here's, you know, here's the best thing that I have. Here's what's most representative of my voice as a creative. And if you want to continue, I'd be, if you want to continue the discussion, I'd be happy to send you more later and get it for into further into the weeds. I think that's key to not overwhelm people because that's, yeah. to be totally honest, a really easy way to get your material put onto an intern's desk or into someone's trash. I would also take in mind that, and I don't have a specific place, but I would say all places, right? So it's like, it sounds kind of like wishy-washy, but like in general, like, you have IGTV, you have Vimeo, you have YouTube, you have your personal website. Like there's so many places that people are going right now to consume content. And so, especially like Dexter was saying, if it's your best piece of work, which is great, then put it everywhere, you know, email it to friends, tell them about it. Say, you know, this is something I'm really passionate about. If you know anyone to pass it on to, or if you want to share it on social or whatever, but you know, yes, you want to make sure it's really good, but also so distribute it like crazy. There's no glory in being like, well, I only use Vimeo because, you know, I'm a real artist. And that's like, if people don't see it, then they don't know. So you can make the best <laughs> thing ever, but nobody's seeing it, right? And so at this point, you know, people are on social media, on some kind of platform, you know, all day. Even if you do it in segments across TikTok, you are probably more likely to catch the eye of someone that like didn't know about it or that wants to share it. And and I think it's, you know, really important to not limit yourself with like, you know, uh, you know, real artists only put it here. Or, you know, this is, I, I got to just keep it, you know, homogenous this platform. I think you really need to feel open and know that it's a really smart tactic to put it as many your content that really represents who you are as many places as possible and to you know it, it can go as far as making sure you're sharing it on linkedin right because of the people that you're looking to work with are on there you want to you want to have your content up there so i think that's also really important is to not limit yourself um with where you're uh, distributing your your work awesome um, so we are at about five minutes out, um, and I think I covered, or at least we touched on some points with most of the questions um, that came up. Um, one thing I'd, I always like to do when we um, engage along with current Jumbos is um, current students is thinking, what would you, if you could look back, you know, maybe there was like a professor statement or a highlight in your highlight reel of your time at Tufts. What's like the sound bite that you, um, this is for each of you, that you would leave with uh, in part on the students today? So this is like the top, my top five, or um, this is the advice I'd give to my future Jumbo self. No pressure. <laughs> I think I can jump in, why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think, I mean, we've said this a few times. Um, I just think when, you know, we are all very high achieving, very smart people. And I think when you graduate college or you're about to graduate college, you put an enormous amount of pressure on yourself to figure everything out and to have a five-year plan and a 10-year plan. And where am I going to be next and all of that. And I think particularly in this world that we're in now, but also just in general, try to take the pressure off yourself to figure every single thing out. Take something you're interested in and try it. Try it for a year, try it for two years, see if you like it, because you never know where it's gonna go next. Um, when I was at Tufts, you know, like Kyle said, we didn't have a lot of um, sort of education around arts admin jobs and things like that. I really didn't know 
what I wanted to do. Um, I was an off-Broadway company manager for five years. And I, if you had asked me when I was in college, I never would have thought I would have gotten into marketing. Um, but I found a really perfect niche for myself in the company I'm in now. I have no idea where I'm going to be five years from now. But right now, I'm really happy and I like <laughs> my job. So I think it's just remember to take the pressure off yourself and that everything is just a next step in the right direction. Awesome. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I would also say, I think, especially for the for the entertainment industry and in sort of in contrast with other industries that you'll see, obviously, we all come from large friend groups or big, you know, different areas where you see your friends going off in different things. And every career industry that you're going to get into is going to have different speed of promotion, a different speed of what you're able to achieve. There's if you're in the entertainment industry, especially like scripted content like tv or film you should be in that space i think really because you can't really see yourself doing anything else and i think a part of that is being comfortable with having to do groundwork having to work your career up from the very bottom having to do things that might seem trivial or above you or things like that and i think just to echo what was just said that you need to be all right with that be confident in yourself not not be stressing out too much about how you're doing compared to your peers in terms of career timeline and uh, just let that passion. And at the end of the day, know what you're doing is something that you're passionate about. Have that lead the way above everything else. Awesome. I would say, um, I tell this to everyone that works for me, but your job is not your life. So like we're talking about jobs and I get them and all of that, but I encourage everyone to like have a hobby right? Get multiple hobbies, find things you love to read, do places that you want to learn about, you know, and eventually when we can travel, but like, <laughs> this is just your job. And so it's great to be passionate about it. I love my job. It's great to love your job and like the people you work with, but it's not who you are. It doesn't make you who you are. It doesn't make you, you know, better or worse than anyone. It doesn't make you immune to COVID. It doesn't make you immune to racism. Like it is just a place that you work. And especially whether nonprofit, I've worked in, you know, for nonprofits, I've worked for government, I've worked for you know, done work for the NFL, like literally the whole span, it's still a company and you are still an individual. It's not your family. It's not the people that know and love you and know every aspect about you. And so I think it's really important that you know that this is, it's just work. And like, yes, it opens doors and yes, it can play into a lot of things that you're passionate about. But if you're truly passionate, just like Dexter said, it doesn't matter where you are and it doesn't matter exactly how you're going to get up there. What matters is like, who are you? What are the things that you love to do? What are the things you're passionate about? Like, I love social media. Like, luckily, I love being, you know, in the space, but I want to tie dye and knit and run and I teach cycling and, you know, I like writing and all of that stuff. But I think what it is really important about that is that that makes you better at your job. People that are diverse in their thinking and their actions that are looking at different stuff that are coming from a different perspective. I don't want everyone on my team to be following the same people on Instagram because that does nothing for me, right? Because then we have just a cycle of the same conversation, the same ideas. I want people that are interested in theater, but also people that are interested in, you know, sports and whatever it might be. But, you know, really feel free, especially now. Go with your hobbies, like be interested in other stuff, learn a new skill, learn stuff that like you've always wanted to do. That makes you a better employee in the end. It makes you more of an asset. It gives you more things to talk about. Um, and, you know, just use the hours of the day for things outside of work. You know, if you're applying and you wake up in the morning, you roll over, you're applying for jobs and you're freaking out and then you go to bed and you're doing the same thing. That's not a day. It's not a life. It's the same thing if you already have the job, right? So wake up, go for your walk, do your yoga, meditate, think about what you want to do, journal. If you have a hobby, make sure you're getting that in every few days. Like just really know that like work is work and it's, it's great when you have something you love and it's great when you're working towards something bigger but it's not who you are and and you don't have to to feel that way and you don't have to feel that it validates you or the things that you love awesome thank you so much anybody else want to jump in there 
Um, I can go really quickly. I, I would just say, I would echo what everybody said. It's really, really good advice. And I would say in terms of career, um, think about the next step, but also check in with yourself every year or even more often than that, like every three months and say, how am I growing? What have I done recently that I would not have done um, six months ago or that I didn't know how to do six months ago? Your career growth and your growth as whatever discipline you want to excel in is your own responsibility. And so you need to be checking in with yourself like that and think about if I want to stay at my company or where I'm working now, what are the things that I need to do? What are the opportunities I need to get this growth opportunity that I'm really interested in? Awesome. And I'll, I'll just hop in to say um, the shortest path from A to B is not usually linear. And if it were linear, it wouldn't be rewarding. Um, so, go, you know, go in some ways where the wind takes you. Um, but I also think stay relentlessly curious because that's, to me, the hallmark of a Tufts education and of a liberal arts education. Um, and I cannot tell you how, w what an asset that is in the workforce to be someone who is is interested in a variety of things has a has their finger on the pulse of, of so many different areas because you never know what is going to influence something else that you're working on but also um in a lot of the businesses that we've been talking about today the opportunity is not something or opportunities that may present themselves to you are not always packaged in the most obvious way. They're not always posted on job sites. They're not always um, cultivated in the way that you would think they're going to be delivered to you. Um, and to, to my mind, having the, the sort of capacity to recognize where you can be useful, where you can serve others, where you can help grow yourself and grow the purpose, hopefully, that you're working toward um, is, is a huge asset to you and to, and to the people you'll work with. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for your time out of your busy schedules to connect with those on the Hill and um, so grateful and for all your awesome advice and um, definitely stay connected with us. We'll keep you posted about future events. Um, so the, for students, make sure that you're seeing all of the summer programming that's on the YouTube career list on their schedule. We'll have a lot going on this next school year for you as well. Ideally, a um, virtual trek um, that may be national and one day um, in October, October 16th is what we're looking at. So, you know, there's probably questions and thoughts. So just follow up with the career advising team and we'll be happy to work with you and kind of work through your questions as always. So thank you all again for participating. Have a great day and we will see you all soon.